The end game for many RuneScapers is getting into the highest levels of PVM and learning to take down the most difficult bosses. But the most difficult bosses in RuneScape 3 have some serious learning curves compared to most other games. There are plenty of experienced PVMers around at this point, but there are also many players struggling to get into higher level bossing as well. Good day everybody, and welcome. Nobody's accounts were born with 7 Essence of Finality switches, multiple loadouts costing several billions of GP each, and several action bars hotkeyed that we are comfortable using. <laughs> I'm by no means the most skilled or wealthy PVMer, and I exclusively play on an iron now moreover, but I have a lot of tips at this point for players looking to ease their way into high level bossing after uh, being used to only basic gear and full revolution setups, for example. Uh, without getting too sweaty. If you're just trying to get into difficult bosses and combat challenges that RuneScape has to offer, and you've seen videos of some of the most talented players running through bosses, it can look really intimidating. To be honest, I've been back into RuneScape 3 for about three years now, after about a decade break, and I've maxed the main account and just recently maxed my iron, and I'm still very confused very often by what I see in other streamers and YouTubers' boss kill videos. There's a good chance you've heard that we'll start seeing more tweaks and nerfs to content that uh, Jagex and the player base have deemed unbalanced or overpowered, namely the Fractured Staff of Armadillo and Animate Dead that will be modified very soon. On the one hand, changes like this make it more difficult for elite scapers to make every boss look like a stick of warm butter being cut with a Tetsu Katana. But on the other hand, it'll also make high level PVM more challenging for players that were relying on overpowered crit sticks and damage sponge spells to get by. I'm personally very adamantly against switchscaping and carrying tons of gear for specific abilities or situations in combat, and I haven't even started using an Essence of Finality yet on my iron as I've just recently completed my first one, and I'm really burnt out on grinding clues for fortunate components. So. It makes me cringe at the moment to think about draining charge on my essence of finality. Anyway, the point of stating all that besides just to complain about the EOF is to say that I have been easing myself into harder and harder bosses without getting outrageously sweaty. And I've learned some things along the way that I think will help you too. And it should be obvious at this point, but just to be very clear, this is absolutely not a guide for top tier PVMing with full manual rotations and 47 keybinds and gear switches and all that. So with that said, let's jump in. Number one tip, use the arc gla- mm, let's see, I just learned how to pronounce this. Use the arc glay core, nope. Number one tip, use the arc glacors. yeah, jeez, arc glacor. Number one tip, use the arc glacor to build up your skills, arc glacor. I just recently learned how to not pronounce it Arch Glacor, so bear with me. But anyways, Arc Glacor. Uh, this tip is obvious to many, <laughs> but it's still undervalued by a lot of players, I think. Uh, in my opinion, Jagex really nailed it with the release of this boss, uh, as the intent was to introduce a boss that is accessible to mid-level players and potentially an incredible challenge to even the most advanced players all with a middle ground meant to seamlessly teach players several core bossing mechanics. And that is exactly what this boss delivers. The Arc Glacier is amazing as well for getting combat experience, valuable drops, and summoning charms, even as a low-level player killing it with no mechanics enabled. If you're brand new to it, you can start with no mechanics enabled and start enabling its mechanics one by one, whenever you please, as you get more comfortable fighting it. The Arc Glacier has a way, better than any other boss in my experience, of introducing players to core mechanics that'll help you fight much more difficult bosses by teaching mechanics such as shield switches and resonancing big hits for the normal mode frost mechanic, sorry, frost cannon mechanic, or using devotion plus anticipate for the mechanic in hard mode as it spans multiple hits and stuns, so you have to deal with that and the adrenaline management to make sure you don't waste it all before you need devotion, and even how to panic shield switch and debilitate and resonance if devotion is still on cooldown, uh, and many other mechanics. The Arc Glacier is the nicest boss also to streak with increasing in rage and hard mode. The only other streaking boss is Telos, which is on another level, and other bosses within rage mechanics are much more punishing. As you slowly build up to higher and higher enrages at the Glacier, you will start to see smoothly where you need to change your strategy and actually deal with mechanics more effectively instead of just soul splitting your way through everything. You'll start to notice very gradually and very nicely where 
you start taking too much damage to just tank through everything. So I think that's great. Number two, gradually remove ultimates and key abilities from your full revolution. And I am assuming you're watching this guide because you're used to full revolution. Uh, especially if you follow the previous tip and train on the Arc Glacier in hard mode. You'll see that for bosses with more complicated mechanics, you will often screw yourself if you drop berserks or tsunamis randomly from your revolution bar. This step is very easy for many players, but if you've been living on full revolution forever, an easy start is with a medium level boss, say at God Wars Dungeon 2, like uh, Vindicta or Twin Furies. Um, it really messes up your flow if your revolution just fires off a sunshine or a berserk when you know, they only have 5,000 HP left because these ultimates will no longer be available until well into your next kill. You're not in any real trouble if that happens at a boss like that, but here you can play with intentionally timing ultimates and abilities like this to see the difference it makes in your kill times. Better yet, um, practice on a boss like Twin Furies specifically and take ultimates off of your revolution and maybe keybind a few AoE abilities if you're using a halberd. Uh, you'll see a big difference here versus full revolution because during the Twin Furies last mechanic, the supercharging big boom bomb, uh, they can easily both be hit by AoE attacks and they take double damage. I am not doing that in this case, by the way, because my best halberd is tier 80 and the Abyssal Scourge that I have with its stacks of Abyssal Parasite actually do a lot more damage than that, just staying zero down one. But anyways... Um, what this all means, anyways, is that saving a Berserk or a Sunshine or a Tsunami for this part is way more beneficial than randomly triggering it like 30 seconds before their big boom mechanic starts because you'll miss out on a lot of damage. So as you get comfortable bossing like this, you can remove from Full Revolution or at least Hotkey more abilities that benefit you to use with intentional timing. To be honest, I don't go anywhere near Full Manual and typically just take Berserk and the Zoop Cape Overpower off of Full Revolution if I'm meleeing, for example. And I just leave everything else on there. All hotkey, barge, because I don't have greater barge yet, or other key abilities needed for certain bosses, but mostly, like I mentioned previously, I don't get very sweaty on purpose. The Arc Glacier in hard mode with increasing enrage is a good place to practice uh, this too. Sticking to melee for this example, once you get more used to the idea of adrenaline management, you can, uh, you can save your berserks for the prayer flicking mechanic or the frozen core when you get the most benefit. Zook Overpower is also great uh, to save you from the Frozen Core, so you can blast out of there quickly, as another example. And maybe you have a Meteor Strike with a two-hand weapon on deck for when your Adrenaline is high and the uh, Glacite minions spawn, just to clear them out even qu more quickly. Tip number three, baby yourself with Animate Dead to learn a new boss. It's irritating to me the amount of high-level PVMers and clans that are so strongly against group members using magic tank armor for bossing, or any tank armor for bossing. It makes sense for PVMers who are already experienced and have much better DPS setups than Crypt Bloom or regular Animate Dead setups offer, but, but for learners it really sucks and it makes it difficult to find groups of people to learn advanced bosses with. I have cruised a number of PVM friend chats and clan chats, and the only forgiving ones gear-wise I've found are Iron Chats. Uh, like Iron Man chats due to limitations of Iron Man and Iron Woman accounts. Anyway, for regular accounts, it's not much of a problem to get some relatively budget power gear when it's time to get into group PVM, but in the meantime, Animate Dead is a great helper for learning most bosses once you've done the quests to use Animate Dead. Even with a nerf, it should help you negate a lot of damage from mechanics that you're not used to yet. Just bear in mind that now, typeless damage will no longer be reduced with Animate Dead. Your boss runs will be slower than with a much more DPS heavy melee or range setup, but this isn't necessarily a bad thing for learning. Because slower kills will inherently force you to deal with more of a boss's mechanics as they're able to cycle through them more, you'll be forced to deal with them and learn how to deal with them. The important thing here is to not just tank mechanics because you can with anime dead. Do your best to deal with them properly as if you're not cushioned. If you manage, great. If not, the impact is greatly minimized in most cases. I found that once I shifted from a low DPS animate dead setup after I got comfortable with the boss into a higher DPS setup, melee in my case, it was really hard to ever go back and really easy to wean off the animate dead crutch. Number four, get certain staple gear and abilities if you don't have them already. There are a lot of gearing options in RuneScape 3, but there are specific items and upgrades that change your PVM experience far more than others. 
For example, meleeing with a Jaws of the Abyss is relatively affordable and a huge bonus to your adrenaline gain. Add a Abyssal Scourge on top of that, and now you're playing RuneScape 3.5. The extra damage from the Scourge's Parasite effect, and moreover the added constant adrenaline gain from the combo of the Parasites and Jaws Helmet is totally nuts in the difference it makes to the abilities you can fire off. And it doesn't cost terribly much to add those to your melee setup. Cinderbane Gloves are another even more affordable piece of gear for all styles, and the combo of these with Blood Reaver Familiars will take you straight into RuneScape 4 when fighting poisonable bosses. The DPS increase from Poison is bonkers from this. If you don't know how the synergy works, basically Cinderbanes give an added chance for poison damage to occur for every hit you land on an enemy, and Blood Reavers hit your enemy for tiny damage every time you heal from any source, like a Soul Split or a Scrimshaw Vampirism or food. The actual damage from the Blood Reaver is negligible, but the real deal is that all the extra hits from the Blood Reaver add a lot more chances for poison to proc and hit for damage. An expensive but overpowered way to abuse this further is with a bow and Bic Arrows, uh, mainly for bosses with several hundred thousands of HP, since Bic Arrows take a while to build up stacks, but greatly multiply poison damage. A less expensive and still effective way to use this poison synergy is with the melee setup I mentioned. Uh, with melee, you can heal simultaneously from Soul Split, the Vampirism Aura, and a Scrimshaw of Vampirism. This adds a lot of extra hits from the Blood Reaver, and so more hits from poison. The Abyssal Scourge's Parasite hits also help the Cinderbane's trigger as well. Just getting the Scourge and Jaws on my iron have dropped my best Vindicta kill times by about 30 seconds, and other God Wars dungeon bosses further because they're poisonable, and I have Cinders too. And by the way, I don't even have any of the Dragonkin Laboratory codexes on this iron yet, so no Greater Barge, no Greater Fury, no Greater Flurry, and Melee is still my, by far my best DPS setup thanks to these very few gear upgrades. For magic and ranged, invest in basic codexes like Corruption Blast and Corruption Shot, which are very affordable. Greater Ricochet and Greater Chain from Raksha are expensive, but will also drastically change the game for you. Uh, greater Dazing Shot from Shattered Worlds is still the best reason to play that minigame now, and makes two-handed range much more damaging. Lastly, as far as must-haves for magic, uh, the God Wars Dungeon 3 codexes. Uh, greater Concentrated Blast and Magma Tempest are well worth it. Greater Concentrated Blast is regarded as one of the most powerful abilities in the game, period, right behind Greater Ricochet. There are countless gear and ability upgrades I can mention here, like the nearly game-breaking Essence of Finality, controversial opinion, <laughs> but I'll cap my list here for now and keep uh, my suggestions as newbie-friendly as possible. Number five, there are some PVM groups that are quite learner-friendly. Uh, the most popular PVM friend chats actively have rules banning tank armor or requiring high tier expensive gear to join PVM instances, but not all chats and clans actively block <laughs> learners. A good starting point if you're interested in learning PVM with unique mechanics in a group is uh, Mazcab Raids, or at least just Beastmaster Durzag uh, runs for starters because Yakamaru in the raids is extremely difficult even just to stay alive uh, throughout for an inexperienced player. Uh, there are some friend chats that take and encourage learners, like Raid School. Uh, all the groups i found so far are still strict about requiring power armor, but are otherwise learner-friendly. The only exception to this is Iron Clans, where Beastmaster Durzag runs are hosted pretty frequently, and the requirements are very lax. Uh, because getting high-tier power armor is difficult for irons, most people who do Beastmaster runs in these clans are using Animate Dead, and often you'll see low-level irons in Lunar Armor and a Guthix Staff. Uh, it's basically leeching at that point, but... Irons support irons. One reason I can recommend Beastmaster runs at, at least and full raids when you're ready is because you can start off as just a DPSer. Um, this means you just sit there and attack things while everybody else takes on the more complicated roles. And there are several roles that need to be filled in a Beastmaster encounter, as some players need to tank the pet mini bosses and other enemies during the fight, as well as tanking and backup tanking Beastmaster himself. As you get comfortable quickly as a DPSer, you can ease your way into pet tank rolls or tanking the chargers, for example. This does not involve the most difficult boss mechanics in all of RuneScape, but it will force you to learn to use several defensive abilities to survive if you're new to it, and you'll do it with the community helping you along. And once you get more used to it, you'll find that you need less and less defensive abilities as you um, get the hang of it, and this will help you a lot for more difficult bosses later. Number six, level archaeology and do the extinction quest. 
Uh, I mentioned both in the same points because they both have to do with adrenaline gain and conservation. Of all the non-directly combat-related skills in RuneScape, archaeology and its relics make the most difference by far to all styles of combat, I think. Invention being the most next most impactful non-combat skill, or, well, I guess that'd be the most impactful, but anyways, I won't talk about invention here. At low-level archaeology, you can get the Berserker's Fury Relic, which many players regard as a best-in-slot combat relic because it boosts your damage by up to 5.5% for all styles, depending on how low your HP is. Another staple relic is available at 98 Archaeology, Fury of the Small, which gives a flat plus one adrenaline gain per basic ability use. This is amazing and very much changes what your ability rotation can look like. Lastly, my favorite is the Conservation of Energy Relic, which refunds you 10% adrenaline every time you use an ultimate. This does require level 118 Archaeology to use, but reminder for all these relics that you can use an Archaeology Potion and get all the relics while you're three levels below the requirement. Uh, on a very related note, completing the Extinction Quest will allow you to enable the effect of the Ring of Vigor as a passive effect that is always active. If you don't know, the Ring of Vigor is a cheap, low-level Dungeoneering reward that also refunds you 10% of your Adrenaline when an ultimate is used. It, is, it used to be a best-in-slot ring switch for that until, thankfully, uh, Jagex decided to kill that part of Switchscape. I'm very happy about that. The passive Vigor effect, then, and Conservation of Energy Relic do stack and give you back 20% Adrenaline whenever you use an ultimate. This is absolutely huge and is, again, something that opens up much more powerful um, ability rotations for all styles. Uh, lastly, there is actually my favorite relic, Persistent Rage, uh, which is also available at level 98 Archaeology. Ooh, I have to double check that. Uh, yes, Persistent Rage requires 98 Archaeology, and actually I misspoke. Fury the Small only requires 97. Anyways, uh, the Persistent Rage Relic Power got a rework fairly recently, actually, and it causes you to gain adrenaline passively outside of combat. While this isn't directly a DPS increasing ability, it does top up your adrenaline to max almost without fail between kills of many bosses you may be farming. And it's my actual favorite because this does actually lead to directly faster kill times because you can start each kill of a boss with an ultimate ability and a rotation from there. Alright, I'm gonna stop here for now. When it comes to high level PVM and increasing your DPS, there is so much more we could talk about and much more than I am familiar with to be honest with you. Um, I didn't even touch invention or back criminal bolts or various essence of finality applications and many other things. For now, these are the tips I consider a basic starting point to best ease you into high-level PVM without getting into super switchscape or without getting super, super sweaty yet. Um, if you want to from here, if you want to eventually, I think this is a good starting point uh, just to ease you in. If you have other tips to share from your experience entering high-level PVM uh, from when you were really inexperienced, please do. And also, if you know any good clans or friend chats for learners for PVM, please mention those as well, since that will be a great help to a lot of people. Um, I'll have some in the video description that I know of, but mostly they're for irons. If you enjoyed this video guide and would like to see more helpful guides and fun content, please consider liking this video and subscribing. I appreciate you very much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.